The following is a presentation of Apologetics Press. For decades now, we've been told by the naturalist dominated scientific community that evolution, not creation, is the scientific choice, and that people who don't believe it, people who believe in the Bible, for example, are somehow unscientific, uneducated hillbillies that believe in ancient mystic fairy tales, carriers of a blind, evidenceless faith. In truth, the opposite is the case. The creation model fits with the evidence. And the evolutionary model is irrational and unscientific. Irrational since it violates the law of rationality, unscientific because it contradicts the scientific evidence. For example, the laws of science stand in the way of naturalistic evolution. If anything can be said to be scientific, it's the laws of science since they have been formulated based on mounds and mounds of scientific evidence that substantiates them beyond a reasonable doubt. The first big question, which is yet unanswered by the evolutionist, that illustrates the fact that evolution requires a blind faith, why do the laws of science even exist? Where do they come from? Who wrote them? Without a lawmaker, how could they even exist? Humanist Martin Gardner wrote a few years ago, Imagine that physicists finally discover all the basic waves and their particles and all the basic laws and unite everything in one equation. We can then ask, why that equation? And why are there quantum laws? There's no escape from the super ultimate questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? And why is the something structured the way it is? Even if the naturalist ignores the little problem of how the universe came into existence in the first place, he still has the problem of how the laws that govern that matter came into being as well. Why are there specific equations and specific numbers that describe how things work. Equations, by definition, are not random. They indicate structure, design, intent, planning, a mind. Those kinds of words can't be used to describe random chance processes and chaos, which are words that describe evolution. Bottom line, someone had to write the laws for the universe to follow. The atheistic evolutionary community admits that it doesn't have an answer to the question of the origin of the, of the scientific laws. They admit it and move along like it's not a big deal. Like the problem can just be ignored and atheism can just be blindly accepted. But wait a minute. If there isn't a reasonable answer to that question, atheism is false before we even get started. If there's no answer to how the laws could come about naturally, then the evidence points to the supernatural and God should be allowed back in the science classroom, especially since the classroom is His anyway. Stephen Hawking believes that quantum mechanics could create a universe from nothing before the supposed Big Bang happened, which he also believes in. But again, even if that were true and the evidence stands against it, see our website, www.apologeticspress.org, for more on that subject. Hawking himself still had to ask the questions. Did God create the quantum laws that allowed the Big Bang to occur? In a nutshell, did we need a God to set it all up so that the Big Bang could bang? Now his stubborn answer was no, but the problem is he couldn't provide answers to those questions. He couldn't even attempt an explanation. And yet he still flat out rejects the idea of a God whose existence would actually give him a reasonable answer to the problem, revealing his own bias against God, his lack of objectivity and unscientific approach to the question of God. How could a law of nature exist without a law writer? Another famous atheist, a theoretical physicist, cosmologist, and astrobiologist of Arizona State University, Paul Davies, he said, you need to know where those quantum law, where those laws come from. That's where the mystery lies, the laws. They don't have an answer because you can't have a law without a law writer. The existence of the laws of science are positive proof that God exists and that naturalistic evolution is inadequate in its attempt to harmonize with the evidence. A law of science cannot evolve itself into existence from an explosion. The law has to already be in existence in order to govern the nature of the explosion. This is proof positive of creation, not evolution. One of the things that I'll try to point out over and over in these sessions is that while the naturalistic model has no reasonable explanation for several critical points in the universe, the creation model is perfectly in keeping with the evidence. Little by little, 
As the scientific evidence is examined, barriers are raised in front of evolutionary theory that prohibit it from being true, while the creation model stands unscathed. While atheistic models can't explain the origin of the laws of science, the creation model has a rational explanation. Long before the laws of thermodynamics were formally articulated in the 1850s, long before the law of biogenesis was formally proven by Pasteur in 1864, 1864 the laws of science were written. In the last few chapters of the book of Job, God made a speech to Job, humbling him with the knowledge that Job knew essentially nothing in comparison with God, who knows everything and created everything in the universe. Two of the humbling questions that God asked Job were, do you know the ordinances or laws of the heavens? Can you set their dominion or rule over the earth? Rhetorical questions. The obvious answer was, no, sir. I couldn't write the laws of science. I don't even understand them. Implied in the questions is the fact that God could do those things. He knows the laws of the heavens and can set their rule over the earth. So, of course, you would expect them to be in harmony with the creation model. In the same way that a poem requires a poet, a law requires a law writer. Always, without exception. No human can point to an example of a law existing without there being a law writer that wrote it. If we stick with the evidence, being rational, by drawing only those conclusions that follow from the evidence, we infer that there is a law writer. Naturalistic evolution is left being unscientific and irrational. Atheism, naturalism, can give no explanation for the existence of the laws, which leaves a supernatural explanation, which harmonizes with the Bible, the creation model. The mere existence of the laws of science is a powerful testimony to the existence of the grand law writer. Recall that according to the McGraw-Hill Dictionary of Scientific and Technical Terms, a scientific law is a regularity which applies to all members of a broad class of phenomena. Not some, all. There are no known exceptions to the laws of science. So if a scientific theory is developed which contradicts those laws and speculates that the laws could be broken, that theory is unscientific. It flies in the face of mounds of scientific evidence. And since it's not in harmony with the evidence, it's irrational, and the theory should be thrown out in favor of one that harmonizes with the facts. In this session, let's consider two laws of science to see what they have to say about naturalistic evolution, the first and second laws of thermodynamics. I think it'd be worth our time to carefully and systematically go through the implications of these two laws to make sure that the point is clearly understood. The scientific implications of these two laws alone give strong evidence against naturalistic evolution and for the existence of God. The principles of thermodynamics have been in existence since the creation of the, of the universe, one engineering textbook says. The word thermodynamics stems from two Greek words, thermae, meaning heat. You'll recognize words like thermometer, thermostat, thermos. The second word, dunamis, meaning power. Our word dynamite is derived from that word. So it describes the early efforts by engineers to convert heat into power or energy. Today, thermodynamics refers more broadly to the science uh, dealing with all aspects of energy and energy transformation. Now, what does that have to do with evolution and the origins question? Well, stand back and consider this question. Where could the universe have originally come from? What are all the possibilities? Let's think through that question without assuming anything, without assuming the existence of God. Let's, let's just look at the evidence and reason through this. Let's make it a little more tangible. Let's say you move into a new home and you're looking through your new attic and you come across a stainless steel box, a cube, and it's completely sealed. In fact, you don't even see an opening to get into this box and yet you shake it and realize that there's a ping pong ball in there. Again, there's no opening, there's no crack anywhere. How in the world did that, did that ping pong ball get in there? What are the possibilities, even the unlikely ones? Well, maybe someone built the box around the ball somehow? Maybe put the ball in the box and sealed it so good that you can't even see the opening? Well, there's actually a couple other options. Maybe no one put it in there. Maybe it created itself in the box. Or it always existed in there. Well, that's basically your options. There's basically three options, really, when you boil it all down. Someone put it in there, no one put it in there, or it put itself there. And the same options are available for the origin of the universe. How did it get here? Well, 
science can give us some insight into what happened. The creationist's answer to the question is, of course, that someone put the universe here. In the very first verse of the Bible, Genesis 1-1, we're given the creation model's answer to the question. In the beginning, God opened up the box and put the ping pong ball in there, essentially what we have. Now, how would we describe that option from a scientific perspective? From a thermodynamic perspective, we could describe the creation model this way. Imagine that box from your attic. Imagine that it's big enough to fit the entire universe in it. So the box is the exterior boundary of the whole universe, the blast radius of the Big Bang, if you're a naturalist. Everything in the universe is in that box. It represents a closed system. If we're using thermodynamic terminology, which means nothing is, is going into the box because everything in the universe is already in the box and nothing is going out of the box because the boundary of our box is big enough to encompass everything in the universe. According to the creation model, before day one, the box was empty. And God essentially opened that box, created the universe, put it in the box, and then closed it and sealed it so that nothing else could enter or leave the box. So the box has remained closed since then, except at those times when God engaged in miraculous activity, that is, activity that momentarily put the laws of physics on hold and allowed God to do something that was not natural, something that was above nature or supernatural. So that's the creation model in a nutshell. Now the evolutionary model typically includes some form of the Big Bang Theory. Steady state Big Bang Theory claims that all of the matter and energy of the universe was originally crammed into an extremely hot, dense sphere the size of a period on a piece of paper. The cosmic egg, or as they call it, the ilum. And then that tiny sphere supposedly exploded, hence the Big Bang. And then expansion occurred over time until we have the universe as it is today. The problem is that even if you believe in the Big Bang Theory, it still doesn't explain where that little sphere could have even come from. The little ball that blew up, where did, where did it come from? Even if we were to grant that the Big Bang actually happened, which I don't, but for the sake of argument, let's say we grant the Big Bang, where could the ball have come from? The Big Bang Theory doesn't answer that question. It doesn't tell us how the ball got into the box in your attic. Evolutionist Alan Guth is a cosmologist and physics professor at MIT. He admitted this very point, recognizing that the Big Bang attempts to explain why the universe appears to be expanding or inflating, but still doesn't explain where the little universe ball originally came from. He said, quote, Inflation itself takes a very small universe and produces from it a very big universe, but inflation by itself does not explain where that very small universe came from. Later, he said, a proposal that the universe was created from empty space is no more fundamental than a proposal that the universe was spawned by a piece of rubber. It might be true, but one would still want to ask where the piece of rubber came from. Now, logically speaking, there are only three options for where it could have come from. A well-known philosopher and evolutionist from the 1800s, Herbert Spencer, said, quote, Respecting the origin of the universe, three verbally intelligible suppositions may be made. We may assert that it is self-existent or that it is self-created, spontaneous generation, or that it is created by an external agency. And that's true. That's what reason and logic tell us. Those are the three options. Now, as I said before, someone put it, no one put it, or it put itself. So which option's right? Which one is in keeping, in harmony with the evidence? Creation, spontaneous generation, or eternality? Well, in the words of Sherlock Holmes, said back in 1890, when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So if two of the three possibilities for the origin of matter can be shown to be impossible scientifically, that is, they violate the laws of science, then the other alternative must be the case. Now, if you choose the atheist route, the naturalist, then obviously you eliminate the creator option from the table, and you're left with only two possibilities for the origin of the universe. And in order to attempt to be rational, the atheist has to believe in one of these possibilities, since he doesn't believe in God either spontaneous generation, so in other words, the self-creation of the universe, or the eternality of matter, in other words, that it is self-existent. Now, if you believe in the spontaneous generation option, that is, that matter could spontaneously generate, just pop into existence on its own from nothing, then in a thermodynamic sense, you believe that that original box in your attic was initially completely empty. Let's zoom inside of the box here. So the box is empty, we're in the box. The spontaneous generation model claims that no one put matter in the universe. It put itself here. So according to the spontaneous generation model, you could stand around inside of that box just staring into nothingness 
and given enough time, all of a sudden, pop. Something could just appear. Not only could something pop into existence, but according to this version of the model, a little ball containing all of the mass and energy of the entire universe just popped into existence. Then, so they say, the Big Bang process started. And eventually, given enough time, the universe expands, life comes into existence and gradually evolves over time, and finally you accidentally show up in the universe. But there's a problem with that idea. Evolutionist Willard Young explained the first law of thermodynamics correctly when he said in describing it that energy can be neither created nor destroyed, but can only be converted from one form to another. And he's right. No argument there. That's what the first law states. We observe from studying nature that energy can be neither created nor destroyed, but can only be converted from one form to another. The law is also known as the law of conservation of matter and energy. Now, what does that mean, practically speaking? Think about a wood log burning. You ever wondered where it all goes when it burns? That pile of ash certainly can't account for all of what the log started out as. The first law says that in a process like wood burning, matter and energy will change into other forms while it's burning. Heat, light, smoke, and ash. But the amount of energy in the universe that was present before the wood burn is the same as the amount of energy in the universe that is present after the wood burns. Now, energy hasn't disappeared or been destroyed from the universe by burning that wood, and energy hasn't popped into existence in the process. Using more technical terminology, the first law of thermodynamics says that in a closed system, like our box that contains the universe, where there's no energy coming into the system or leaving the system, so no one's opening that box and putting energy or matter into the box or taking it out, the amount of energy within the boundaries of that system will remain constant. So as this chart shows, the amount of energy present before a process, a process like wood burning, or in our case, the universe popping into existence, the amount of energy present before a process must be the same as the amount of energy present after the process. So if you start with no energy in the box before the process, then in order to equalize the equation, you'll end up with no energy in the box after the process. If you start with nothing in the universe before the appearance of the cosmic egg, no energy is going to be able to create itself to give birth to the cosmic egg. Nothing pops into existence. In other words, it doesn't matter how long you stare into an empty space, a pew isn't going to just pop into existence. And it certainly isn't going to come to life and start walking around. It doesn't matter how much time you wait for that to happen. Nothing's going to pop into existence from nothing. Not an atom, a tree, a fish, an ape, a human, Certainly not a small sphere containing all of the energy of the entire universe. It's not going to happen. According to the first law of thermodynamics, which, remember, has no known exceptions, there's never been an exception to the law witnessed. So by implication, it would be unscientific. It would go against the laws of science to believe that matter could have come into being in such a way that the first law of thermodynamics was violated. According to the first law, the only way matter can appear inside of that box is if it was caused to appear there by something outside the box. That's what we learn from science. Evolutionists who believe in spontaneous generation actually admit that there's no evidence for it. Atheist Victor Stanger, who's an evolutionary particle physicist and professor at the University of Colorado, he's a believer in the idea of spontaneous generation. But he actually came out and said, quote, I must admit that there are yet no empirical or observational tests that can be used to test the idea of an accidental origin. What? <laughs> Part of the naturalist's own definition of science includes the ability to observe and test a theory. You mean spontaneous generation of matter is a genuine blind faith? True Christianity is built on faith, yes. But as I said in the previous session, it certainly isn't blind. There's abundant evidence to support it. The trust we have in the Christian system is based on evidence, not a blind leap into the dark. But according to atheists themselves, there's no evidence to support the spontaneous generation of matter. Now consider, if there's no scientific evidence for it, then how can this idea be considered to be scientific? There's no way to test it. It's a leap into the dark without evidence. No wonder many evolutionists reject spontaneous generation as an option for the origin of the universe. Famous evolutionary astronomer Robert Jastrow was the founder and former director of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies at NASA. And he said, quote, but the creation of matter out of nothing would violate a cherished concept in science, the principle of the conservation of matter and energy, which states that matter and energy can be neither created 
nor destroyed. Matter can be converted into energy and vice versa, but the total amount of all matter and energy in the universe must remain unchanged forever. It's difficult to accept a theory that violates such a firmly established scientific fact. That's pretty straightforward. But what about quantum mechanics? Doesn't quantum theory indicate that something can come from nothing? That's a relatively recent argument being made by some in the evolutionary community. But quantum fluctuations that convert energy to matter must first start with a quantum field. So such theories still aren't starting with nothing. Stephen Hawking attempts to argue that the universe could pop into existence since he believes there's a zero energy balance in the universe now, and there was zero energy before the cosmic egg appeared. But even if he could prove that there's a zero energy balance in the entire universe now, which he can't, he still admits that there was no energy in the universe before, and now there is energy, regardless of whether or not it balances out due to its positive and negative signs. According to the first law of thermodynamics, that energy has to be accounted for. It can be neither created nor destroyed in a natural process. Strictly according to the scientific evidence, the laws of science, specifically the first law of thermodynamics, the spontaneous generation of matter could not have happened. Now keep in mind, no scientific laws have exceptions or else they would not be laws. By definition, scientific laws describe regularities that apply to all scenarios that the law applies to. In order for something to be a law, scientists could never have observed any exception to the rule. A prominent thermodynamics textbook used in engineering course curricula says, the basis of every law of nature is experimental evidence, and this is true also of the first law of thermodynamics. Many different experiments have been conducted on the first law, and everyone thus far has verified it, either directly or indirectly. The first law has never been disproved. We can say that the second law of thermodynamics, like every other law of nature, rests on experimental evidence. Every relevant experiment that has been conducted, either directly or indirectly, verifies the second law, and no experiment has ever been conducted that contradicts the second law. The basis of the second law is therefore experimental evidence. The evidence from science is that the laws of thermodynamics are immutable, they are unbreakable, so we call them laws. When the first law indicates that the universe can't pop into existence from nothing, it means it. But notice, the creation model does not contradict the first law of thermodynamics. The first law says that in nature, nothing, matter, mass, energy, nothing's going to pop into existence from nothing. It will not be created on its own. Believing in such an idea is like believing in witchcraft. The only way energy can come into being in a system that did not originally have that energy is if it is deposited there from something outside of that system. In other words, the universal box, which contains everything from the natural universe, would have to be opened up and energy would have to be put in by something supernatural, something outside or above the natural universe, which is exactly what the creation model says happened. Genesis 1 tells us that God put everything in the universal box. And then Genesis 2, 1 through 2 says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished, and on the seventh day God ended His work, which He had done. So, in harmony with the first law, matter didn't create itself. It was put here by a supernatural agent, Jehovah. And after He created it, He shut that universal box. In other words, He rested or ended His work. Nothing else is being put into the box. Nothing else is coming into existence. Nothing is creating itself. Well, that's a summary statement of the first law of thermodynamics. Isn't it amazing that scientists didn't formally state the first law until the 1800s, and yet God had already laid out the thrust of, its, of, of what it teaches thousands of years ago in the Bible. The creation model is in perfect harmony with science, with the first law of thermodynamics, unlike the evolutionary model. What about the other option? Could matter be eternal? The eternality model claims that the universe has always been inside of that box. No one put it here. It, it didn't pop into existence. Rather, the universe always has been. It's either been moving through space forever, expanding, or if you believe in the oscillating universe model, you'd believe that the universe operates in a cycle involving a collapse, another big bang, an expansion, a collapse, another big, big bang, expansion, and so forth, repeating forever. Either way, forms of this model say that matter and energy are eternal. It's always been here. But again, we've got a major problem with that kind of idea in light of the scientific evidence. And the problem comes in the form of the second law of thermodynamics. Recall well-known atheist, physicist, cosmologist, and astrobiologist Paul Davies. Writing in New Scientist, he said, quote, 
The celebrated second law of thermodynamics says, roughly speaking, that in any change, the universe becomes a slightly more disorderly place. The entropy goes up, the information content goes down. This natural tendency towards disintegration and chaos is evident all around us. And he's right. Returning to our wood burning example, when wood burns, all of the energy that was present before it burned is still present according to the first law. But according to the second law of thermodynamics, much of it has transformed into less usable forms of energy, like heat. After that heat dissipates, we're essentially left with a pile of ash, which of course isn't nearly as usable. In a technical sense, the second law of thermodynamics builds on the first law and says that although the same amount of energy is present before and after a process, according to the first law, some of that energy has transformed into less usable energy. This is known as entropy, and the process is irreversible. Now what this means, practically speaking, is that everything is wearing out. It's deteriorating. It's decaying. It's moving towards a state of disorder or chaos. Now, we can slow the process with work, but we can't stop it. The universe is running down. We're running out of usable energy. Nothing lasts forever. And you can see this idea everywhere. A car doesn't get nicer over time, does it? It deteriorates. It rusts. It falls apart. Your room doesn't get cleaner on its own without someone working on it. Very unfortunate for me. But the second law prohibits it. Is a house's paint job going to get nicer over time? Of course not. It fades. It chips. The house is going to wear out and eventually collapse. And again, just like the first law, the second law has never been broken. It has no exceptions. A prominent engineering thermal science textbook says, quote, To date, no experiment has been conducted that contradicts the second law, and this should be taken as sufficient proof of its validity. So what does that mean concerning the origins question? What are the um, implications? Well, it means that the universe could not have always existed and we still have usable energy. According to the second law of thermodynamics, if, if the universe is infinitely old, we shouldn't have any usable energy left. Everything should be completely worn out and deteriorated. And yet we have an abundant amount of usable energy in the universe in, in harmony with the creation model, which says that the universe is relatively young, on the order of six to 10,000 years old. The scientific evidence does not lend to the conclusion that matter can be eternal. And therefore, some scientists have come out in agreement. Recall the famous evolutionary astronomer Robert Jastrow of NASA, considered to be one of the greatest science writers of our age. He said, and concurrently, there was a great deal of discussion about the fact that the second law of thermodynamics applied to the cosmos indicates the universe is running down like a clock. If it's running down, there must have been a time when it was fully wound up. He also said, modern science denies an eternal existence of the universe. He said, now three lines of evidence, the, motion, the motions of the galaxies, the laws of thermodynamics, the life story of the stars, pointed to one conclusion. All indicated that the universe had a beginning. Kitty Ferguson is an award-winning science writer and evolutionist. She agreed. She said, it's also common knowledge that the universe isn't eternal but had a beginning. So many in the evolutionary circles realize the universe had to have a beginning. But the skeptic replies, yeah, but couldn't there have been an exception to the laws of thermodynamics at some time in the past? Well, again, according to the definition of a scientific law, there are no exceptions to laws. The evidence always stands against them. The laws of thermodynamics don't have exceptions. They are the fixed, unvarying conclusions from the scientific evidence. To claim that there are some unknown exceptions would be to claim something that goes against the available evidence. In other words, it would be irrational. There's our word again. The laws of thermodynamics are firmly established and are beyond doubt. A perpetual motion machine is a design that attempts to violate either the first or second law of thermodynamics, a machine that tries to find an exception to the laws. Numerous attempts have been made over the years to design such a machine, all without success. If a person could make such a machine, they would be rich. But such machines are simply impossible. Even the government of the United States understands this truth, whether or not they fully grasp the implications. The laws of thermodynamics have been substantiated to the point that in 1918, the U.S. Patent Office declared that they would no longer accept patent applications for alleged perpetual motion machines. The Patent Office was sick of getting applications for these impossible devices. They recognized the attempts as pointless. But as Philip Yam, writing in Scientific American, said, claims for perpetual motion machines and other free energy devices still persist, of course, even though they inevitably turn out to violate at least one law of thermodynamics.
There simply are no exceptions to the laws of thermodynamics. Now, to develop a theory that requires breaking the laws of thermodynamics would be unscientific. Developing a theory that sets the universe up as a perpetual motion machine, being able to last forever in defiance of the second law of thermodynamics, is unscientific, no matter how much jargon a person uses to confuse the issue and throw dirt in the air. Believing in such theories amounts to irrationally drawing conclusions not warranted by the scientific evidence, evidence all of which supports the idea that nothing lasts forever. But notice again that the biblical creation model is in harmony with the second law of thermodynamics. The creation model predicts decay and a gradual loss of usable energy, as the second law states. According to the creation model, the universe will not last forever. It will grow old and deteriorate. Hebrews 1, verses 10 through 12, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. Let's summarize. There's only three options for the origin of the universe. Spontaneous generation, eternality, creation. Second, by definition, the laws of science have no exceptions. Number three, the laws of science prohibit the evolutionary possibilities for the origin of the universe. Finally, the creation model doesn't. It's in perfect harmony with the laws of science and even predicts their effects. The conclusion, the creation model is the scientific choice since it harmonizes with the scientific evidence. It's the rational choice because it is a conclusion that follows from that evidence. And beyond that, the creation model is the only possible choice left after the naturalistic options have been eliminated. And don't forget that there's another conclusion that can be drawn from the evidence as well. If matter was created, there must be a creator. The scientific evidence points to the fact that there is a God. God Himself wrote the natural laws that govern the earth into existence. God alone is capable of such a feat, so you'd expect them to harmonize with the creation model perfectly, and they do so. Not so with the evolutionary model. Laws certainly can't write themselves into existence, and so the atheists can't explain their origin. And furthermore, the message implied by the law stands as a concrete testament against atheistic theories to anyone willing to examine the evidence without prejudice. Bottom line, there is a God. This has been a presentation of Apologetics Press, an organization dedicated to the defense of New Testament Christianity. Visit us on the web at apologeticspress.org or call 800-234-8558.